Thank you. And the uh, next item of business is a statement by the Cabinet Secretary, Derek Mackay, on the Scottish Government's draft spending and tax plans for 2019-2020. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance will take questions at the end of his statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions, but uh, I would urge members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on Derek Mackay. This Scottish budget prepares our economy for the opportunities of the future, enables the transformation of our essential public services and builds a more inclusive and just society. It does so in the context of continuing UK austerity and against a backdrop of a UK government careering towards Brexit at any cost. In sharp contrast to the chaos and uncertainty of the UK government, the Scottish government will keep on delivering good governance for Scotland. Just this week, we've had confirmation of 80,000 affordable houses built since 2007. Record low unemployment, the numbers of teachers and teaching students increasing, school attainment improving, and the new Best Start grant starting to provide help for low income parents. For the benefit of the Tories in the Chamber, that is strong government. Yeah. Some some might even say strong and stable government doing its job, delivering for the people. This budget builds on that strong base. It provides an economic stimulus and supports the sustainability of our public services. This is a budget that safeguards the people of Scotland as best we can from the risks we face using all the powers and resources at our disposal. We all know, despite their promises, the UK government hasn't ended austerity. The UK budget in October 2018 failed to provide much needed direction and leadership for a longer term finances and wider economy. On spending, the Office for Budget Responsibility confirmed in October that the UK government could spend £15.4 billion more and still meet its fiscal rules in 2020-21. There can be no doubt the Prime Minister did not keep her promise to end austerity. Instead, we have austerity delivered by choice, not necessity. Austerity condemned by the United Nations. The price Scotland is paying as part of the UK is economic and social vandalism. The facts are these. Scotland's resource block grant will be almost £2 billion lower in real terms in 2019-20 than it was in 2010-11, a fall of 7%. If this year's budget consequentials for investment in the NHS are excluded, which is reasonable given our commitments to pass all of these consequentials on to health, our 2019-20 resource block grant is £340 million less in real terms than it was in 2018-19. And that puts a huge strain on public spending which this budget works hard to manage. And it's not just austerity that puts pressure on our budget. Economic consensus warns us of the damage of Brexit. The UK government admitted two weeks ago, in a watershed moment, that it does not matter what kind of Brexit they secure, any kind of Brexit will make us poorer. The Scottish government's position is clear. The best option for the future well-being and prosperity of Scotland is to remain in the EU. If Scotland is forced out of the EU as a result of the actions of the UK government, it is vital that they ensure no detriment to the Scottish budget. The UK government's decision to take us out of the EU single market and customs union, a market of over 500 million people, is reckless and unnecessary, and our growth forecasts are subdued as a consequence. Today, the Scottish Fiscal Commission has published its latest set of independent economic and fiscal forecasts for Scotland. The Commission has revised up its forecast of GDP growth in every year. They now forecast GDP in Scotland to grow 1.4% in 2018, which is faster than the growth expected in the UK as a whole. They then expect the Scottish economy to grow 1.2% in 2019, 1% in 2020 and 2021, 1.1% 1 .1 in 2022, and 1.2% in 2023. However, the Commission highlights that Brexit is a key factor 
that is expected to lead to slower growth in productivity, population and trade in future years. This means less money for public services and it risks making Scotland a less attractive place for businesses. As a responsible government, we are preparing as far as possible for all exit possibilities and we're intensifying preparations in order to protect the Scottish economy, our businesses and our workers. We've set up new teams in the Scottish Government to support preparations, including an international trade and investment policy team. We've doubled the Scottish Development International presence in Europe and we're investing £20 million over the next three years to enhance and intensify support to businesses looking to export. Significant resources have had to be diverted, not just in the Scottish Government, but across the public sector to prepare for the impact of Brexit. A no deal Brexit and continued chaos from the UK government will only make matters worse. So it is disappointing but necessary for me to advise Parliament that if the UK does end up in a no deal Brexit, I may be required to revisit the priorities in this budget. However, stepping back from the brink and remaining in the EU would mean that resources could be returned to supporting frontline priorities. That is just one of the many reasons this government believes we should remain in the EU. Unlike the UK government, we've chosen to use the levers at our disposal to boost our economy and support our public services. We will continue in 2019-20 to deliver a public sector pay policy that lifts the 1% cap on public sector pay. And I can confirm today that I've agreed a public sector pay policy for 2019-20 which provides a 3% pay rise for all earning £36,500 or less, higher than forecast inflation. It caps the pay bill at 2% for all those between £36,500 and £80,000. And it continues to contain pay rises at the higher end, capping any increase for those earning over £80,000 to £1,600. This is a reasonable, and affordable public sector pay approach and continues on a journey of restoration of public sector pay. However, I must disappoint my colleagues and say that ministerial pay will once again be frozen at 2009 levels. <laughs> our commitment to public sector workers is part of our commitment to high quality public services. This government has made clear that our priority is closing the attainment gap and improving education. We are determined to improve the life chances of children and young people in Scotland and change the lives of our future generations for the better. This is our defining mission and that is why I can announce today that the education portfolio will receive a real terms increase in investment in 2019-20. We'll also provide almost 500 million pounds to expand early learning and childcare supporting the recruitment and training of staff and investment in the building, refurbishment and extension of around 750 nurseries and family centres. We'll invest over £180 million to raise attainment in schools and close the attainment gap, including £120 million that will go direct to head teachers through the Transformational Pupil Equity Fund. And we'll invest over £600 million in Scotland's colleges and maintain investment at over £1 billion in Scotland's universities. And to ensure young people have a range of avenues open to them, we'll invest over £214 million in apprenticeships and skills to support the ongoing expansion of apprenticeships in Scotland as we progress towards 30,000 starts per year. This government will continue our work to tackle poverty and mitigate the worst impacts of the UK government's welfare cuts. We're already using the newly devolved social security powers to create a social security system based on dignity and respect. In a recent report on the UK, the UN Rapporteur on Poverty and Human Rights condemned the British government's punitive, mean-spirited and often callous treatment of the country's poorest and most vulnerable. I welcome the Rapporteur's references to the very different approach being taken by the Scottish government, noting the establishment of a social security system guided by evidence and the principles of dignity, fairness and respect, recognising that we are mitigating the worst of UK government welfare cuts 
in describing our plans for tackling child poverty as ambitious. This government will continue to work to tackle poverty, support new families, and ensure that every child has the best possible start in life. And we'll also continue to mitigate the worst impacts of the UK government's welfare cuts. The delivery of the new social security system and the safe and secure transition of the new powers will continue to be a key priority for this government. In 2019-20, we'll deliver fair and dignified social security assistance over and above what the UK government provides, with a total forecast expenditure of £435 million. This will include forecast spend of £37 million for carers allowance supplement, providing vital support for our carers, £12.4 million for the new Best Start grants to assist low-income families with essential expenses on the birth of a child and at key transitions in the early years. And this will support families with young children who are feeling the impact of the UK government welfare cuts and £6.2 million for our new funeral expense assistance, helping those on lower incomes with funeral costs. We will also provide nearly £100 million to continue our mitigation of the bedroom tax and the UK government welfare cuts. And we'll increase the budget for our Fair Food Fund from £1.5 million in 2018-19 to £3.5 million in 2019-20, with £2 million specifically to tackle food insecurity during school holidays. Safeguarding Scotland, we'll continue the protection of the police resource budget in real terms, provide over £5 million of additional resources to the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service to support their transformation, and increase the funding to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service by £5 million to recruit additional legal staff to manage increased caseloads. The Scottish economy is the powerhouse that fuels ambition for Scotland and we are determined to unlock its potential. And I want to see a country that is globally competitive with innovation, sustainability and fairness at its heart. That is why this year I launched our new economic action plan with a number of decisive measures to improve the competitiveness of our business environment. We will support an advanced manufacturing challenge fund of up to £18 million to ensure that all parts of Scotland benefit from developments in advanced manufacturing. Invest £5 million as part of our three-year £20 million plan to boost exports and work with partners to enhance the digital skills that businesses require, including a new £1 million digital start fund to support people on lower incomes. We'll also invest around £2.4 billion in our enterprise and skills bodies and develop the work of the Enterprise and Skills Review and Strategic Board. In addition, the Scottish Government has committed around £1.3 billion to support Scotland's seven cities and their regions to maximise economic opportunity. In 2019-20, we will secure fully agreed city-region deals for Stirling and Clackmannanshire and for the Tay Cities region. We'll progress growth deals for the Ayrshires, Borderlands and Murray. Progress discussions for Argyll and Butte, Falkirk and the Islands and continue our financial commitment for the city region deals in Glasgow, Aberdeen, Inverness and Edinburgh. These investments will benefit all of Scotland, creating thousands of jobs and upskilling local labour markets, building on the economic strengths and opportunities for each region. We have a clear commitment to fair work and employability and as part of this, we will invest £5 million over three years to support around 2,000 women to return to work following a career break. We'll support parents to address barriers to work and providing in-work support to help low-income parents remain in work. And we'll develop our Fair Work First principle for public procurement so that as much of our funding as possible supports a fair and inclusive economy. Investment in people is crucial Creating meaningful employment is the best social policy. We also know that greater investment in infrastructure improves quality of life, boosts productivity, and makes our country a more attractive place to do business. That is why this government will increase capital investment by £1.56 billion per year by the end of the next parliament. This budget begins that journey and sets out capital investment of more than £5 billion over the coming year, including 
£1.7 billion investment in our transport infrastructure, more than £180 million towards city region and growth deals, and £175 million of investment in nursery and childcare buildings. Of course, it is vital that the right investments are made to generate inclusive growth and to deliver on our low carbon objectives. We must act on climate change. Our investments in broadband, transport and utilities will provide a foundation for companies to invest and bring new economic opportunities across Scotland. And as part of this vision, I'll continue with our groundbreaking work to establish a Scottish National Investment Bank. This budget will provide £130 million of funding to establish the bank and precursor investments. The next £50 million of the £150 million Building Scotland Fund announced last year will provide debt and equity support to the private sector and organisations such as housing associations and universities to support the development of housing across all tenures, develop modern industrial and commercial space and support industry-led research and development. In 2019-20, we'll invest a record £826 million as part of our total of investment of over £3 billion to deliver 50,000 affordable homes over the course of the Parliament across, across the length and breadth of Scotland. Building for Scotland and building new homes too. As well as building more homes, we're continuing to protect those buying their first home and progressing through the property market with our progressive land and buildings transaction tax. But for those purchasing additional properties, I'm proposing to increase the additional dwelling supplement from 3% to 4%. Legislation will be laid before Parliament tomorrow and if approved the rate change will come into force on the 25th of January 2019. I've listened carefully to the business community. They seek investment in skills, people, innovation and infrastructure and this budget delivers such investment. We're committed to providing the best possible environment for businesses supported by a competitive non-domestic rates regime. Last year, I limited the increase in business rates to CPI inflation, and this year, I will go further. I'm announcing today that we will cap the increases in the rates poundage in 2019-20 in Scotland at below inflation level of 49 pence, limiting the increase to 2.1%. This will ensure that over 90% of properties in Scotland and all small and medium-sized businesses will pay a lower poundage than they would in other parts of the UK. I can also confirm that I'll continue to uprate the poundage in line with CPI for the remainder of this Parliament. Our package of business rates reliefs, including the small business bonus, is the most generous anywhere in the United Kingdom, worth an estimated £750 million in 2019-20, and continuing the growth accelerator will give us a further competitive advantage. I'm also proposing changes to non-residential land and buildings transaction tax, which will mean that Scotland has the most competitive rates in the UK. Under these proposals, two thirds of all non-residential transactions will pay less tax in future than at present. Again, I'll lay legislation on this change before Parliament tomorrow, and if approved, uh, rate change will come into force on the 25th of January 2019. These measures will help our businesses grow, prosper and be successful. We are proceeding with the Barclay Review recommendations to reform non-domestic rates. Businesses have asked me to rule out the introduction of an out-of-town levy, a recommendation from the Barclay Review. And while the Barclay Review recommended that we explore this possibility as a means of supporting our town centres, in light of proposed UK taxes, I do not believe it would be right or fair to introduce such a tax at this time. We will, of course, keep this under review. However, I share the view that our town centres require support in a changing retail environment. So I can announce today that we will establish a new £50 million capital fund to support our town centres to diversify and develop, ensuring our town centres are thriving, sustainable places where people choose to spend their time. Presiding officer, 
Last year, we took the decision to introduce a new progressive, fair and balanced income tax system that raises additional revenue from those who can most afford it and protect public spending. This helps us make Scotland the kind of country we want it to be, funds our public services, support our economic infrastructure and supports those most in need. Our income tax proposals will continue to follow the four key tests the Scottish Government introduced last year. Protecting the lowest paid taxpayers, improving progressivity, raising additional revenue for public services and protecting the Scottish economy. I have decided this year that I will not increase any of the rates of income tax. Tax rates will remain the same and as a result 99% of all taxpayers will see no increase in the tax they pay. However, in 2019-20, I'll increase the starter and basic rate bans by inflation to protect our lowest and middle earning taxpayers. The higher rate threshold will be frozen. This will ensure that 55% of Scottish taxpayers continue to pay less than they would if they lived elsewhere in the UK. And Scotland will continue to be the lowest tax part of the UK. For example, a pensioner earning £15,000 with access to free personal care, free bus travel and cheaper council tax will be better off by around £9,700 in 2019-20 relative to the rest of the UK. Well, someone earning £62,149, the same as an MSP, will pay just over £30 a week more in income tax in Scotland than they would elsewhere in the UK. But that's before you consider any of the benefits of Scotland's social entitlements, like state-funded university tuition, which we will continue to protect. <laughs> At a time of constrained growth, prolonged austerity and growing economic uncertainty, all as a result of a failing UK government. Now is not the time to cut tax for the highest earners at the expense of our public services. Instead, I will be using the additional resources raised through my tax decisions in this budget to support our public services and ensure that our health service gets all of the additional money they were promised. The UK government failed to deliver in full on of the resources that they promised our health services, leaving us £55 million short. My decisions will ensure that we can restore that amount, and I believe this is the right decision for Scotland. Our tax policy supports our public services and investment in our economy, while Scotland continues to be the fairest tax part of the UK. Our economy has grown faster than the rest of the UK in the first six months of this year, and there is no evidence whatsoever in the Scottish Fiscal Commission's report that our income tax policy in Scotland is slowing growth. But I want my decisions to be based always on the best evidence. So I will be asking our Council of Economic Advisers to expand their analysis of the impact of the potential behavioural effects and the possible impact on future revenues. Providing the necessary investment for health in a fair and balanced way this is equipping our frontline services to take forward the measures set out in the health and social care financial framework and waiting times improvement plan. We recognise our NHS and wider health and social care system must continue to adapt to the changing needs of our population. In 2019-20, we'll continue our improvement of these vital services. And I can announce today that I'm increasing the health portfolio resource budget by almost £730 million. That's an increase of almost £500 million in real terms. This decision confirms that health is a top priority for the government and will take spending levels to £754 million over and above inflation since 2016-17, the equivalent of 19,000 nurses. We will also deliver a further shift in the balance of spend towards mental health and primary, community and social care. And as part of this, we're increasing our package of investment in social care and integration 
to more than £700 million in 2019-20. And we'll increase our direct investment in mental health services by £27 million, taking the overall funding for mental health to £1.1 billion in 2019-20. And this includes our work to improve mental health services support in schools. The decisions I've taken in this year's budget will also allow me to increase funding for local government in 2019-20, providing total support of £11.1 billion. And let me be clear, this provides a real terms increase in both revenue and capital funding and an overall real terms increase in the local government settlement of over £210 million. <laughs> this budget safeguards Scotland using all the powers, resources and tools available to do so. If opposition parties choose to argue for additional spending in any area over and above what I've set out in this budget, then to have any credibility, they need to indicate where the money should come from. Should it come from a rise in the basic rate of income tax and hit those on lower incomes? Or should it come from a cut to public services? And if so, which public services would they cut? the NHS, education or local government. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government cannot completely protect Scotland from the recklessness of the UK Government, but the decisions we've taken in this budget ensures that we protect what matters most. We choose to transform our early learning and childcare, protect funding for education and improve attainment, invest record sums in our health services, provide a real terms increase in total funding for local government, expand free personal care, and deliver a fair and just new social security system which will support those most in need. We're doing all this whilst the UK government implodes on their journey of economic self-harm. And that is why the people of Scotland have entrusted us to focus on the delivery of our public services and the economy. This budget delivers for the Scotland of today and invests for the Scotland of tomorrow, and I commend it to the Chamber. Thank you very much. Could I encourage members who have yet to do so to press their request to speak buttons if they wish to ask a question, and I call on Murdo Fraser to open. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the advanced sight of his statement, heavily redacted as it may have been. Presiding Officer, it's a source of regret for us all that today's big statement has been overshadowed by events at Westminster. I refer, of course, to the £950 million increase in the Scottish Block Grant announced by the Chancellor in his budget in October. An increase which means that, according to Spice, the Finance Secretary's total budget has not been cut by the Conservatives, but is up in real terms nearly £1 billion pounds since 2010. In advance of today's budget, every business representative group in Scotland had one key ask from this Finance Secretary. They asked that the tax differential between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom would not increase, because they were concerned about the impact a growing tax gap would have on their ability to recruit talented people to Scotland a concern which has been echoed by those in the public sector. And yet the Finance Secretary has today chosen to ignore all of these calls with the announcement today that the threshold for paying higher rate tax will be frozen. And that means that from April, those earning in Scotland between £43,430 and £50,000 will face a marginal tax rate of 53% on every extra pound that they earn. It means a police sergeant earning £45,942 a year, will pay over £700 in tax, more than his counterpart south of the border. A senior nurse manager earning £49,000 will pay £1,350 more than south of the border, and a principal teacher earning £51,330 will pay more than £1,500 more than those south of the border. That is the price of living in the SNP Scotland. And, presiding officer, 
anyone earning just over £26,000 will be paying more than their equivalent south of the border. No one will seriously argue, surely, that a household with an income of £26,000 is rich, and yet these are the people being punished in the SNP Scotland. And, presiding officer, there was no need to do this because the Finance Secretary had more money in his budget. £950 million more in Barnet consequentials. There was no requirement for the tax rises we have seen today. Signing officer, we will scrutinise carefully the spending pledges in the budget today. We welcome the additional money for the NHS, made possible by spending choices made at Westminster and the UK Conservative government's commitment to health spending. And in relation to local government, we will look at the figures in detail. But the headline sum announced today falls short by £1 billion compared to what COSLA assessed they needed just to stand still. So while people are paying more in taxes, they will face poorer local services. This is a pay more, get less budget, presiding officer. And it doesn't have to be this way. There is a different route the Finance Secretary can choose. We are happy to sit down and have a serious discussion with him about his budget if he commits to reducing, not increasing, the tax gap with the rest of the UK, and if he commits to dropping the SNP's ruinous plans for a second independence referendum, will he join with us and develop a budget to help the people of Scotland and not punish them? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, uh, that was an offer I'd like to refuse from Murdo Fraser in terms of the budget. It is true to say that our budget from 1819 and to 1920, excluding the health uplift, which I'll just return to, means a £340 million real terms reduction for all other public services in Scotland. That is the outcome of the Chancellor's budget. But through our tax position, we are restoring the shortchanging eh, undertaken by the Conservatives, taking £50 million away from the health service, and our tax decisions restore that amount, taking NHS funding to record levels. And of course, the Chancellor's budget does nothing to undo the £2 billion real terms reductions since 2010 that's had such a damaging impact on our public services. But I wonder if uh, Murdo Fraser has been discussing with Ruth Davidson, the position on tax, because it was Ruth Davidson who said we should forgo tax cuts to invest in the health service. And in her absence, the Tories have changed their minds. And I won't take any lectures from the Conservatives on the performance of the economy. The Scottish economy is outperforming the UK economy. Higher GDP growth, lower unemployment and more exports coming uh, from Scotland internationally. And of course, if I was to follow the Tory tax plans, we would have to cut Scotland's public services just on income tax, just to follow the Tory position on income tax by half a billion pounds. That doesn't mean a billion pounds more for local government. That means half a billion pounds less for our public services. That would be the consequences if I followed Murdo, Murdo Fraser. We are investing in innovation internationalisation and the infrastructure of our country whilst the Tories deliver economic self-harm. And in terms of what businesses are asking for right now, they're asking for us to invest in skills and infrastructure and a competitive tax regime. And that's exactly what we're going to do, having the lowest tax for small and medium-sized businesses in Scotland, lowest tax part of the UK, fairest tax part of the UK. But yes, the business community is speaking out today. And this is what they're saying. This is the Chambers of Commerce. The utter dismay amongst businesses watching events in Westminster cannot be exaggerated. Or the Federation of Small Businesses. The chaos makes planning ahead impossible. Small firms are crying out for some certainty. So I'll take no lectures from the Conservatives on the economy of our country. We are aspirational. And when I hear talk about the tax divergence, we are building the country that we seek. And if I was to follow the Tory planned cuts on public expenditure, you talk about the divergence in the pay packet between Scotland and England, many of those people wouldn't have a job under the Conservatives because of the cuts you would have us deliver. So this is a fair and progressive budget for the people of Scotland. And I am sure one that will deliver stability and stimulus for our country.
James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance copy of his statement. Public services are at breaking point. Head teachers are writing to parents about unprecedented cuts. One in four children in Scotland are living in poverty, and our rail system is in chaos. This is yet another woeful SNP budget that will let the people of Scotland down. Yet again, ministers refuse to use their powers and to continue to force cuts onto councils. Scotland has been let down by Nicola Sturgeon's timid government and Derek Mackay's timid budget. Scotland needs a radical budget that supports public services, tackles rising poverty and fixes the mayhem in our rail system. If you want to see how badly the SNP is failing the people of Scotland, you just have to look at how local councils are struggling. There are now nearly 3,000 fewer teachers in our schools and nearly a third of children fail to reach the required level of literacy by the end of primary school. Few things sum up the cruelty of the Tory government more than the two-child cap on tax credits and universal credit, which, which punishes people for raising a family. Yet the SNP has refused to use its powers to put an end to this vile policy. And with 230,000 children in Scotland living in poverty, the Cabinet Secretary should have back calls to increase child benefit by £5 a week. It would lift, lift 30,000 children out of poverty and put money in the pockets of families across Scotland. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, why, with over 4,000 families in Scotland affected by the two-child cap, has the Cabinet Secretary sat on his hands, refusing to use the powers of this Parliament to cancel this vindictive policy? If education really is the SNP's top priority, why has this SNP government continued to penalise local councils with £95 million in swinging cuts? And why at a time when one in four children in Scotland are living in poverty has the Cabinet Secretary retained over £300 million in reserves? Cabinet Secretary. I have to say to, to the Labour Party, whilst we've been safeguarding Scotland, the Labour Party has been selling Scotland out, leaving, <laughs> leaving their powers with the Conservatives in Westminster. How about we try this? How about we try and resolve the problem All right, let's hear the Cabinet Secretary, please. How about we remove the Tories' pernicious policies by removing the Tories and taking these decisions in our own Parliament? With the power so to do. But I was waiting, I was wait, waiting very eagerly for the Labour Party's alternative budget. But you see, there's been a leak. There ain't going to be an alternative budget from the Labour Party. According to the Times, there will be no alternative budget. What they've said. Let's hear the Cabinet Secretary, what please. What they've said in previous years. Order, order, one second, please. One second, please. One second. One second, please. Can I just ask members, please, to keep quiet for a second and let's hear, let's hear the questions without members bellowing out. And I'm particularly referring to Mr Swinney and Mr Kelly. Do not bellow at each other across the chamber when a question has been asked and the Cabinet Secretary is replying. Cabinet Secretary. I'm going to, to try and help the, the Labour Party out a wee bit. This government and this budget is proposing to increase NHS spending in real terms substantially, massively. Education increased in real terms. Local government increased in real terms. Uh, welfare, our social security powers over and above, spending over and above what the UK government has given to us. So we are taking an approach based on dignity and respect. But you see, if the Labour Party want an alternative, they have a duty to set out what an alternative budget would look like. Now, I can see what the Labour Party have said. This is a source from the Labour Party in the Times. We could justify our spending decisions with how we would raise the money in previous years. 
Now we have nothing. It's a shambles, says the Labour source. Yes, it is. It is a shambles from the Labour Party. And the same source said in relation to their budget plans, a lack of them. At least when we had a plan, ridiculous as it was, we had a plan. That's the clarion call from the Labour Party. Where's, where's the industrial strategy today? We're investing in the infrastructure of our society. Right, order, please. You see, order. One second the again. Labour Party. Uh, I'm going to ask two things. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I wonder if you just move your microphone slightly closer. And can I ask Labour members in particular, please keep the noise down. We cannot hear a word that's being said. I'm sitting a matter of feet away from the Minister. I cannot hear what he's saying. Please keep the noise down. Cabinet Secretary. You see, the, the Labour Party have no alternative to our budget because they are no alternative whatsoever in this chamber. So could it be tax? Will they propose an alternative? tax plan. Bear this in mind, in Westminster, the Shadow Chancellor has said he will not reverse the Tories' tax plans in the budget. That's the position of the Labour Party and the House of Commons. But what about here in Scotland? What's the alternative revenue-raising option in Scotland? A Labour spokesperson confirmed that an alternative income tax plan would not be set out this year to show how the alternative policies would be paid for. There we have it. A totally incompetent Labour Party opposition, no alternative to our plans, which would increase investment in our country by some £2 billion. That's what the Labour Party would be voting against if they oppose this very positive and progressive budget. Thank you. I call Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's clear that after two budgets in a row where the Scottish Government proposed deep cuts to local government to see those reversed under green pressure, the Scottish Government no longer feels able to turn the screw on local councils and the services that they provide across the country. And I'm pleased that that pressure has been brought to bear. But it's equally clear, it's equally clear, presiding officer, that in the face of rising demand for those services, councils urgently need the power to raise the funds themselves to meet that rising demand and to do it fairly. Why was there no mention in this budget statement of the need for reform of local taxation? Not a word from the cabinet secretary on that agenda. Toward the end of the local government section in the budget document, there is a paragraph buried away confirming that the Scottish Government continues to commit to the policy that the council tax itself must end. But no word at all on the timescale, no word at all on the actions the Scottish Government will take to implement that policy. So can the Cabinet Secretary now say, what will the Government be doing, what will he be doing in the coming weeks, months and years to give real effect to the urgent need for local tax reform to put our local services right across Scotland on a stronger footing, less reliant on a single block grant every year from the Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I'm pleased that uh, Patrick Harvey is, is no doubt the first to welcome the, the package of support for local government amounting to £11.1 billion, and that represents a real terms increase of over £210 million in the the overall, overall uh, settlement. In relation to engagement on the council tax, uh, since I've been finance secretary, the parliament has uh, looked at the council tax, it provided a critique of it, but there has been no majority in the chamber for an alternative. So the pledge that I've made repeatedly in the chamber is I'll work with anyone who's interested on what uh, local taxation should look like going forward, but it should be fair and it should be progressive. And I'm happy to do it in an open, constructive, an engaging way and I think it's important I think it's important to find that conser a, a consensus uh, so that we can give stability to local government finance as well as well as designing uh, the kind of future system that we would all wish to see that's fair and progressive so I remain open to that dialogue I remain open to those uh, discussions and that can be on a cross-party basis. Willie Rennie. Uh, the Finance Secretary has rightly focused on the chaos and uncertainty of the UK government over Brexit is bad for the economy and public services at a time when the Fraser of Allender Institute just this week highlighted the low productivity levels in Scotland.
That's exactly why I have asked for a cessation in this government's campaign for independence, because that would bring even more chaos on top of the Brexit chaos, just when we need stability to focus on the big challenges that this country faces. Our priorities for this budget are investment in mental health services, a decent pay deal for teachers and a fair deal for local government. Why won't he agree to put aside independence for now so we can work together on these important matters? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I didn't mention independence in my budget speech. I mentioned how we're getting on with the day job, delivering our services, growing our economy, stimulating our economy, uh, delivering a more progressive tax system. I wasn't focused uh, on independence. I do happen to support Scottish independence. That shouldn't be a surprise to Willie Rennie and the Liberal Democrats. But you know, so obsessed is Willie Rennie with independence that he could be willing, could be willing to vote down the kind of resources he's been asking for for years on mental health, on education, on the NHS, on a local government settlement, on colleges, even ferries. The Liberal Democrats are willing to vote down the resources that we are offering up in this budget with growth of around £2 billion. That is reckless, not the approach that the Scottish Government is taking. Thank you. I call Bruce Crawford to be followed by Dean Lockhart. Thank you, President Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for getting on with the day job, yeah. delivering for yeah. Scotland yeah. with a budget that's fair, balanced and sustainable. In stark contrast, we see Westminster consumed with constitutional mayhem and the Tory party busy tearing itself apart. Yeah. Cabinet Secretary has set out an income tax policy that will raise an additional income. Can I ask him how much it would cost Scotland's public services if we were to replicate the Tories' UK plans here in Scotland. And would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this Tory recipe would be an absolute disaster for our vital public services? Presiding officer, the Tories causing chaos and crisis at Westminster, planning to do the same with Scotland's public services. Cabinet Secretary. I, I agree with the, the sentiment of uh, Bruce Crawford, but the figure that he seeks is if we were to follow the Tory tax plans just on income tax, it would cost us around £500 million from investment in our public services. If I was to follow more widely than that, other tax plans they have, it would be a cut of around £650 million. Uh, we'd have to take out our public services to fund their tax cuts. And I think that's interesting. So when every other Tory in this chamber stands up with funding requests and demands over this and that, it's true to say they want tax cuts at the, t the same time as spending more. It just uh, is not a credible position from the Conservatives. And if they want to change the budget, if they want to change the budget, let them uh, identify what public services they would cut to follow their tax plans. Dean Lockhart to be followed by Angela Constance. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The SNP has made Scotland the highest tax part of the UK, not only for workers earning above 26,000, but also the highest tax part of the UK for businesses looking to expand. The Barclay Review made this clear. The doubling of the large business supplement under the SNP has made Scotland less competitive for business compared to the rest of the UK. With almost a billion pounds of additional funding coming from the UK government, why hasn't the Cabinet Secretary used this budget today? to cut the large business supplement and make Scotland's economy more competitive. Cabinet Secretary. Well, clearly, clearly Dean Lockhart wasn't listening uh, when I pointed out uh, that 90% of properties in Scotland will pay a lower poundage than other parts of the UK. So every single small and medium-sized business in Scotland will pay less tax by being in Scotland than they would if they were south of the border. And as well as that on income tax, we're fairer, more progressive, investing more for our public services and protecting the economy. So we are in fact the lowest tax part of the UK, but even more importantly, the fairest taxed part of the UK. Angela Constance to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Sir, uh, given the ongoing uncertainty and chaos in Westminster, can the Cabinet Secretary tell us what the consequences will be for Scotland's public services and our economy uh, if this Parliament does not support this budget in the new year? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the 
total budget that is proposed for approval in 2019-20 will provide £42.5 billion of investment in Scotland, almost £2 billion more than 2018-19. Now, the main elements of this are £660 million extra capital, the £730 million extra health resource, £340 million more for Social Security, compared with last year's draft budget. That's what's at risk if this budget is not passed. Rhoda Grant to be followed by Tom Arthur. There's no mention of an industrial strategy in the budget. It simply reheats initiatives that have not worked. There are no new ideas to boost our economy. The Cabinet Secretary takes the opportunity yet again to announce his intention to set up a Scottish investment bank with funding of £130 million, which is some distance short of the £20 billion that we would invest. However, <laughs> despite announcing this initiative, they find that amusing. However, despite announcing this initiative over and over again, we don't know when it will happen and when will the funding re-announced today be in place to benefit our businesses. Can he tell us when the Scottish Investment Bank will be open for business? Cabinet Secretary. Um, sorry, I, I don't think I caught all of the uh, question, presiding officer, because of the laughter at some of the question of Labour's economic and industrial position. Labour has asked for an industrial strategy before. I don't think we need an industrial strategy. We need and are delivering industrial actions. Yeah. Industrial actions is what this government is delivering. More investment, more interventions where it's right and proper and supporting the industry of Scotland. Yet again, we see from the Labour Party, it's just empty rhetoric and words. It's totally meaningless coming from the Labour Party. In terms of the investments we are making, clearly it is making a difference. We've got uh, foreign direct investment, second only to, to London and the southeast of England. We've got rising uh, exports, GDP, as I say, outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom. We've got unemployment at a record low level and lower than the rest of the United Kingdom. And our economic efforts include investment on in infrastructure of some 50, I was almost going to do a Labour thing there and just make up a total number, but I absolutely will not. I will not do that. The actual investment in infrastructure under this government is £5 billion. That's real money, real cash, real investment in the infrastructure of our country. It will have a more competitive rates regime that leads to, to more jobs and economic growth and stimulus. We're developing the National Manufacturing Institute of Scotland. We are building the Scottish National Investment Bank. There is finance forthcoming, precursor investment. The legislation will be working its way through Parliament next year and it will be operational if this uh, Parliament approves that legislation. But even before waiting for the bank to be established, we're investing now through the Building Scotland Fund to support support our economy. So across those range of measures, we'll be stimulating the economy, leading to more purposeful and meaningful jobs whilst delivering inclusive growth and fair work at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Tom Arthur to be followed by Maurice Golden. I agree with the Cabinet Secretary that this is a progressive budget from a strong and stable Scottish Government that stands in stark contrast to the chaos and confusion of the UK Government. However, Given that the Tories' self-indulgent, self-obsessed, self-centred civil war now risks the UK crashing out of the European Union without a deal, can the Cabinet Secretary set out just what the level of risk there is to these Scottish budget spending plans in the event that this shambolic UK government leads us to a catastrophic no-deal Brexit? Cabinet Secretary. Well, presiding officer, I, I agree with Tom Arthur. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, I, thought he, I, thought he, I thought he put it, I thought he put it very well as well, presiding officer. There is a serious point here uh, that this budget, just as the Chancellor's own budget, uh, was based on the assumption of a deal, a deal with the European Union, an orderly um, Brexit. That was the basis on which the Chancellor made his budget and therefore the numbers that underpin this Scottish budget. So in the event uh, that there is a change, yes, we may have to return to Parliament with a revised a budget, but of course uh, we've been trying for some time to get the UK in a better position in terms of the Brexit uh, negotiations, recognising that no Brexit would be the best possible uh, outcome. Uh, but if no deal can be agreed and there is a further UK budget, we will need to understand the implications for Scotland's public finances before revisiting our budget assumptions and presenting revised proposals to the Scottish Parliament. Maurice Golden to be followed by Ruth McGuire. 
Uh, thank you, President <laughs> Officer. Last year's draft budget estimated that Scottish income tax revenues would be £12.582 billion in 2019 20. Today's draft budget estimates that revenues will be £11.684 billion in 2019 20, a massive drop. Why? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think uh, Morris uh, Golden is maybe not as fortunate enough as other Conservative members to be on the Finance uh, Committee uh, to understand that these forecasts are based on FSC numbers, the Scottish Fiscal Commission. They look again at the baseline. The more evidence they get, they move away from the, uh, the estimates that they have been working to and focus on actual outturn or the, the latest data. So I'm sure that uh, if the member wants to pay close attention to the SFC's forecast, he will find that much of this is around the forecasting issues rather than any substantial change in the Scottish economy. That said, that said Brexit <laughs> is the major challenge to Scotland's economy. The impact that Brexit will have on population, on productivity uh, and uh, issues uh, therein are impacting on our economy. That's what's leading to the subdued GDP growth where wage earnings, so on and so forth. So if we did have all the levers, all the economic levers, and uh, it would come along uh, with being uh, fully empowered as a country, then we would be able to make the right economic decisions that could grow our country. But the SFC, the SFC have made it very clear the issues around their methodology and the forecasts that they've set out. Ruth McGuire to be followed by Ian Gray. Presiding officer, Scotland's made huge progress in tackling homelessness, but there's still a lot more to do. And I know that, like me, the Cabinet Secretary will not be prepared to see progress made being undone. Therefore, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to outline what funding there is in the Scottish bu budget to tackle homelessness in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, clearly, uh, local authorities have a, a function here, and it's partly funded through the local government settlement. The settlement has been increased by £23.5 million pounds in recognition of local authorities' responsibilities for temporary accommodation. And they can choose how to use this funding to best respond to the needs of their local area. Uh, this year, the budget also contains a further £10 million pounds from the £50 million pounds Ending Homelessness Together Fund to be spent on implementing the transformational <coughs> recommendations from the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group. Ian Gray to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you. In real terms, this budget cuts funding for colleges, it cuts funding for universities, and it leaves councils unable to restore school budgets currently £400 million less than they were in 2010. Did the Finance Secretary not get the memo about education being his government's top priority? Or did he just choose to ignore it again? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, there's, there's real terms. So, so, sorry, Ian Gray should reflect on the fact that there's a real terms increase for education. We'll be supporting local government with a real terms increase um, as well. We are investing in skills and the attainment gap. We're making great efforts uh, to to support education. And again, if the Labour Party wish to spend even more than we are proposing on education, they should say how, how they would raise those necessary revenues rather than hide away without any serious alternative plan, but only spending requests. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you very much, President Officer. I'm saying also the Finance Secretary spoke of the, the expansion of free personal care during his statement. So can the Cabinet Secretary confirm the amount of, uh, of resource that's been made available to implement Frank's law and expand free personal care to under 65s. Cabinet Secretary. In 2019-20, we are investing an additional £30 million in the local government settlement to implement Frank's law and extend free personal care to under 65s as set out in the programme for government. Miles Briggs to be followed by Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I start by thanking the uh, Finance Secretary for listening to me and others and committing to the £30 million for Frank's law. Amanda Capel, the wife of Frank, is here today in the public gallery and has joined us. And I would like to start by paying tribute to her campaign to deliver this. The can the Finance Secretary, in wider health context, confirm to the Chamber today whether or not the underfunding of health boards and the NREC funding formula will today see no health board in his budget receive parity or above? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the, he the frontline health uh, budget has increased. The budget to health boards uh, is also uh, increased. And I think it's fair to say 
uh, to Miles Brigg. I have heard the campaigning that, that Miles Briggs and, and others have uh, engaged with around Frank's law, and I too pay tribute to the family, and I'm delighted that we're able to progress this. Of course, it is then incumbent on those who have campaigned for many issues uh, to support the budget so that it can actually happen uh, now that I've provided the resources and will provide the necessary uh, bill uh, to take this forward in terms of the budget bill. So I look forward to the support, maybe even of just some of the Conservatives who are going to allow us to invest uh, in this area. But it is a record investment in the National Health Service and more going to health boards as well. Jenny Gilruth to be followed by Monica Lennon. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that, as in previous years, the money made available to schools through the Pupil Equity Fund is to fund additional initiatives chosen by schools to close the attainment gap, and that is on top of the existing funding for core educational responsibilities which councils receive through the local government settlement? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, the Pupil Equity Funding is £120 million in additional funding that is allocated directly to schools to invest in targeted interventions to close the poverty-related attainment gap. And this is in addition to the more than £5 billion core funding local government authorities expect to spend to deliver core educational responsibilities. Monica Lennon, to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased the Cabinet Secretary said that health is a priority for this government. If it had been a priority all along for SNP ministers, perhaps we wouldn't have seen life expectancy in Scotland fall for the first time in 30 years, health inequalities widen, or that Scotland warned that the future of our NHS is not financially sustainable, NHS staff overworked and stressed, and a crisis in our underfunded social care services. Cabinet Secretary, we do need a transformative budget for health and social care that will end the deprivation gap and give everyone the same chance to live long and healthy lives. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain how this budget tackles Scotland's shocking health inequalities rather than simply attempting to keep health boards afloat? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I, I suppose a rough guess would lead me to suggest that an investment of over £700 million might help in that regard that we are proposing in the budget, but I have to say this to the Labour Party, I don't know if Monica Lennon is aware of this, not only are we delivering, we are delivering more than the Labour Party committed to deliver in their manifesto for the Scottish Parliament elections in 2016, and have opposed every single increase that I've put forward for the National Health Service since I've been a Finance Secretary. So I think we could do with a bit more support to invest in our National Health Service rather than the empty rhetoric coming from members such as Monica Lennon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. John Mason to be followed by Liz Smith. John Mason. Hey, thank you. I think the Cabinet Secretary knows that many of us do not like council tax and would like to see it replaced. However, so far there has not been any a alternative that has got widespread agreement. Local income tax might be fairer but takes no uh, account of property and land valuation tax is not widely understood and has some anomalies. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that if we're going to replace council tax we really want widespread cross-party agreement on it so that it can be a longer lasting uh, and in fact permanent uh, settlement for local government? Cabinet Secretary. Um, John Mason always the voice of reason. I, I agree with uh, John Mason that I think we should try and work together, um, work together, and find the consensus um, to find a, a majority in this parliament on what local taxation could look like. I'm open for, uh, to that. I've said so uh, repeatedly when the parliament's previously debated the council tax and local taxation. And my offer is for all parties to discuss together to see what alternatives uh, we can find. Now, there are various work streams underway at the moment, uh, such as uh, the, the Land Commission. So I think we can draw upon uh, evidence that exists, uh, but I commit to being uh, open and balanced and fair uh, in how we take that forward. But a key element for this government is that we want to be progressive in our tax system, uh, whatever tax system that may be. Liz Smith to be followed by Emma Harper. Uh, thank you. With reference to the investment in infrastructure section uh, that is set out on page 40 of the budget paper, could the Cabinet Secretary confirm how much money will be available from the Scottish Government for the essential cross T link road? Cabinet Secretary. I would need to refer to the uh, Transport and Infrastructure Secretary who takes forward uh, work around infrastructure in both the city deals, but I'm happy to get back to the member. 
Emma Harper to be followed by Mark Macdonald. Thank you, President Officer. This budget outlines a significant investment in Scotland's health and care services, which will go towards reducing health inequalities for my South Scotland constituents. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary how the increase in the Scottish health budget compares with the uplift in England? Cabinet Secretary. Well, by passing on the resource consequentials and also by reinstating the UK Government's health funding reduction of £55 million, the uplift for the health budget in Scotland amounts to 5.5% and this compares to 5.1% for the health budget in England. Mark Macdonald to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Uh, yesterday I spent some time volunteering with the Giving Tree run by Instant Neighbour, a charity in my constituency. Thousands of children across the North East will this year have to rely upon the kindness of strangers to enjoy a Merry Christmas as a result of the poverty that they and their families are experiencing. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline how his budget will help support families in my constituency whose poverty is often masked by the wider prosperity of the City of Aberdeen? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think I've outlined in the budget support through our uh, new social security system and that uh, we'll be spending more than was uh, allocated to us by the UK Government, whether that's food and whether that's uh, other payments such as the uh, Best Start Grant. Uh, we're also supporting a housing uh, investment uh, and other welfare uh, measures. And I think it's important to recognise that a range of partners have a role in supporting uh, people in times of hardship. And that's why I've tried to protect public services and make a different choice from the Conservatives, which of course is tax cuts. But I think the package of measures that we're undertaking will help to mitigate in as far as we can but of course it would be better if we had of all the powers in terms of economy and welfare in Scotland. Because again, reflecting on that damning report from the United Nations about the pernicious welfare reforms of the Conservatives and the impact that it's having it should be a cause to reflect on where power lies and how we reuse the resources that we've got. But there are a range of measures to support families in need right throughout the year and as a consequence of this budget. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I warmly welcome the announcement of a new £50 million capital fund to diversify and develop our town centres, helping them to thrive. Can the Finance Secretary advise the Chamber on how communities or local authorities will be able to access these funds? Cabinet Secretary. I'm glad that uh, Kenneth Gibson has welcomed the £50 million capital fund for town centres, and I'll deliver this fund in partnership with local authorities, and I'll engage with them over the, uh, the period ahead as to how that, that would be designed, but clearly I want it to be a stimulus for our town centres uh, so that we can unlock the potential of our town centres, support the economy and help them to diversify and adapt, which is what we know is, is required at this time. I call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Shona Robison. Thank you. Can I draw all members to my uh, register of interest? This SNP minor minority government will need allies to get the budget through, allies of the green variety. Patrick Harvey wants local tax reform. He wants a tourism tax. A tourist tax that UK hospitality has pointed out will be detrimental to Scottish tourism businesses, detrimental to those who already pay hundreds of millions of pounds in business rates. So today, can Derek Mackay give reassurance that businesses will not have to endure a tourist tax and will he rule it out once and for all? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I know Rachel Hamilton is very interested in this subject. I uh, very interested. I, I, as part of the Scottish Government, am engaging in a national conversation. As I've said in my budget speech, I'm looking at the uh, evidence in relation to taxation and specifically on the transient visitor levy or tourist tax as it's sometimes called. We're having that national uh, engagement and I look forward to, to seeing uh, the evidence. But again, uh, Rachel Hamilton uh, might want to welcome some of the other elements of the budget, such as lowering the poundage on non-domestic rates. So I think I'm getting a thumbs up to that from Rachel Hamilton. Um, the most competitive package of business rates relief anywhere in the United Kingdom, the continuation of the growth accelerator, as well as all the investments we're making to stimulate the economy. And of course, what will be welcomed by the uh, tourist sector, I'm quite sure, is further investment on infrastructure, such as housing and a, a digital and transport infrastructure as well. I think that will all be very well received as too will be the continuation of the transitional relief for the hospitality sector that I'm continuing in our non-domestic rates regime. 
Thank you. Just for the Cabinet Secretary's information, we've uh, made good progress through the questions. We've got about 15 members still wish to ask questions, uh, just under uh, 30 minutes to go. Uh, several members have added their names. If other members wish to ask or press their request speak buttons and add their names, they can do. Uh, or we might finish early, or the Cabinet Secretary might take longer to reply. Uh, I call... I call... Shuna Robinson. I call Shuna Robinson to be followed by Daniel Johnson. The uh, Cabinet Secretary has set out plans to invest almost £500 million in the expansion of early learning and childcare, which will be warmly welcomed right across Scotland. Is he aware that some councils are already delivering the 1,140 hours in some nursery, nurseries, including in Dundee, where an estimated 290 extra jobs will be created by 2020? And will he join me in urging all councils to use this money to deliver this policy as soon as possible? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. You know, some have said I may wish to uh, engage in time travel. Uh, that's an interesting um, request to, to, to keep going until uh, five o'clock. On the specific question from Shona Robson, of course, some councils have gone ahead um, and have uh, delivered the uh, commitment in advance, uh, but the delivery phase of the expansion is now well underway for early learning and childcare. And that's why the, the multi-year revenue and capital package is so important to fully fund the expansion of this commitment. I would encourage local authorities to continue using the funding we're providing to phase in increased hours in line with the local delivery plans and the expansion planning guidance to ensure that those children who benefit most from the expansion will also benefit first. And that we continue to work together to ensure that all eligible children benefit from the expansion from August 2020. Daniel Johnson to be followed by Fulton McGregor. I was wondering if the Cabinet Secretary could expand on the single sentence he devoted to justice issues in his statement. And given that the SPA state that the recently agreed police pay deal will cost more than 125 million, and indeed that the police overspent by 38 million last year, this means that the modest increase in the budget will be more than swallowed by that overspend alone. So can uh, the Cabinet Secretary confirm that police will need to make savings to meet their commitment on pay? And what impact assessment has been made on frontline police uh, numbers from this? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, it was the SNP government that committed to increase police numbers, and that's exactly what we've done. In sharp contrast to the decrease in England uh, in Wales. Numbers have grown in Scotland and have decreased in England and Wales. In terms of the settlement for the police resource budget, uh, there's a real terms protection for the police resource budget. That's £19.1 million. And I think it's significant to say, of course, uh, that we've allowed the uh, police authority, as is right, to retain the spending power from the decision to be able to reclaim VAT. And the police authority would be in an even better financial situation if we got back from the Conservatives the VAT that they've taken from the police and, for that matter, the fire service. So we are investing in the justice system and we have once again given real terms protection for our police resource budget. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Officer, can the Cabinet Secretary set out what provision there is in this budget to ensure that Scottish Government funds the inquiry into child abuse to ensure that the voices of victims are heard? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Scottish Government has and will continue to fully fund the inquiry, which operates like any other public inquiry, independently of government, to ensure that the voices of survivors of in-care abuse are heard. The purpose of the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry is to raise public awareness of the abuse of children in care. It provides an important opportunity for publicly, to publicly acknowledge uh, of the suffering of those children and a forum for validation of their experience and testimony. Michelle Ballantyne to be followed by Joe McAlpine. Thank you, and I, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement. The devolved elements of the social security system will be administered by Social Security Scotland with a total administrative budget of £41.5 million in 2019 to 2020. That is what is stated in your budget. Earlier this month, it was reported that the Scottish Government has asked the DWP to control carers' allowance for two more years at the cost of £3.4 million, whilst the de devolution of disability benefits is delayed until the end of this Parliament. So can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that there will be no further delay to the Scottish Government assuming executive competence of these benefits past 2021. 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I, I think, to be fair, that's more of a question for the Social Security Secretary to be able to answer accurately, accurately on the position uh, as it stands at the moment. But I've outlined in the budget that the resources we're allocating towards the new Social Security system, the commitments we've made around the payments, but the, uh, and I've also mentioned the, the, the safe and secure transition uh, of that as well. Uh, so we're putting investment in place. I have to just say, of course, uh, this Scottish Government's view of fairness is quite different from the view of fairness from uh, the Conservatives, but we are putting in place the necessary infrastructure and resource to deliver the commitments that we've set out, but I'm happy to defer to the uh, Social Security Secretary in terms of the specific nature of the question. Joan McAlpine to be followed by Polly McNeill. Thank you. The Minister will be aware of submissions to the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee from residents and traders in the Garnet Hill, Sucky Hall Street area of Glasgow, whose lives and businesses have been completely disrupted in the aftermath of the most recent fire at Glasgow School of Art, as indeed has the whole area of that uh, particular part of the city. Um, will the budget offer them any comfort? Secretary. Well, the Glasgow Fire Recovery Fund, which I established in July, is providing up to £5 million to Glasgow City Council to support businesses affected by the fires at the Glasgow School of Art, Macintosh Building and Victoria's Nightclub. The fund has provided 200 businesses with around £3 million in direct support, £20,000 for businesses within the immediate fire cordons and £10,000 for eligible businesses within the wider Socky Hall Street area. And I will shortly be announcing plans for the remaining £2 million and can assure all members that businesses affected by the fires will benefit uh, from the full £5 million. Polly McNeill to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. The discretionary housing payment budget is split into two parts, the bedroom mitigation and other, and that budget has remained static for two years at £10.9 million. The Cabinet Secretary of Finance will know that termination of tenancy due to rent arrears is a major driver of homelessness. But in universal credit areas, it's two and a half times higher. And in fact, there's a case to say that universal credit is now the biggest driver of poverty. So Labour are calling on the Scottish Government today to double the funding of that fund to enable local authorities to spend on the other part of that budget within the discretionary housing payment to 20 million. Will the Cabinet Secretary for Finance consider that if that was included in your budget, that you would prevent more evictions due to rent arrears and you would do a great deal to prevent homelessness? Cabinet Secretary. And can I ask uh, Pauline McNeill, if I put that in the budget, would you vote for it? You would vote for it. You would vote for it. I, I think uh, I understand. I understand, presiding officer, that the purpose here is for the opposition to ask me questions, which I'm absolutely doing. I'm answering the questions. But I think it's an important point here to even ask if I do what's being asked of me, would that member vote for the budget? And I get silence. Silence because the Labour Party have no alternatives to our budget that does invest more in social security, in welfare, in housing, in supporting the most vulnerable in our society. And if the Labour Party want any amendments or changes, the duty is upon them to also show how they would fund it. So I am open to constructive engagements with the Labour Party on ensuring that we have consensus to pass a budget in this Parliament. But I have just said, I hear, I hear Pauline McNeill now heckling me. I made the point, if I made the change in the budget, would the Labour Party vote for it? If they come with a credible set of uh, alternatives and a position, of course I'll engage constructively with the Labour Party. But I fear, as the Labour source has suggested, the Labour Party right now is just a shambles. Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by James Dornan. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for heeding the repeated calls of these benches for extra resources for mental health? But what, co what, confidence, what confidence can the Cabinet Secretary, what confidence can the Cabinet Secretary offer this chamber that this money will do anything to reverse the national scandal that is waiting times for child and adolescent mental health services? And will the resources defined in his statement for mental health support in schools uh, ensure that there is sufficient sufficient resource available so that every child in Scotland can have access to the services of a trained mental health counsellor. 
Secretary. I understand the, the point Alec Cole Hamilton is making, and I think it is right to reflect on the evidence that we have heard and the calls that have been made upon us to support mental health funding, improve signposting, um, support uh, right through the, uh, the mental health um, um, uh, landscape in terms of support that is provided, uh, and also to, to recalibrate systems to ensure that support is there. Uh, when it's needed, and that has included schools and the educational uh, environment as well. So I think it's a very serious question, and that's why we've allocated more. And I know that the Health Secretary and the Education Secretary take a very close interest, uh, particularly in this subject. So we are confident that those extra resources will indeed make a difference. But of course, I would again say that if the budget doesn't pass, those resources aren't released uh, to the health service, uh, to schools and to colleges and to those who will benefit from this investment. I think it's really important that when members ask me what difference will the extra investment make, if they support that investment, surely, surely, if it's so important, they should vote for it. James Jornan to be followed by Alexander Burnett. Uh, local Government Committee this morning, Graham Sharp, the Chair of the Accounts Committee, confirmed to me that despite the desperate claims by our political opponents, that including council tax and other revenue raising measures, funding available to local authorities has not fallen at all. Could the Cabinet Secretary tell me what action has been taken to ensure local authorities continue to be protected despite ongoing austerity cuts the Scottish Government continue to receive from the Conservative Westminster Government? Cabinet Secretary. Oh, I think I've set out a, a budget that ensures that the total core funding package for local government amounts to £11.1 billion. Pounds. It, this is an increased settlement, of course, an increase in cash terms and, and real terms too. It provides real terms increase in both revenue and capital settlements in 2019-20 and a real terms increase of over £210 million in the overall settlement. Alexander Burnett to be followed by Elaine Smith. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I note my register of interest. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary explain why he is proposing that spending on the prevention of flooding will decrease in real terms while so many communities remain at risk, including several in my constituency. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, would that be another funding request from the Conservatives whilst wanting to cut spending at the same time, of course? Uh, these figures in terms of flood prevention and the work uh, around our environmental agencies are taking, uh, it takes the evidence into account, and I think that's a, a, a satisfactory uh, resource, and I don't think that the members should be scaremongering about flood prevention measures. Uh, Elaine Smith to be followed by Rona Mackay. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that effectively tackling poverty depends on increasing household incomes, moving away from the kind of unacceptable society that sees food banks as the norm? And since he will not boost family income and immediately lift thousands of children out of poverty by implementing the £5 a week child benefit top-up, will his government at least bring forward the planned implementation of the income supplement as called for yesterday by churches, charities and experts on eradicating poverty. Families, in po families living in poverty can't wait until 2020. Cabinet Secretary. Well, again, if members have alternatives, they should also bring the alternative revenue raising um, um, mechanism that they would use to, to pay for new commitments over and above what's already in the budget. I'm sure that uh, Elaine Smith Should will absolutely pause? welcome the uh, extra investment in health and education and housing and, and all forms of uh, infrastructure to support our economy as well. I, mean, I happen to believe that the best social policy is also employment, so surely it's to be welcomed that unemployment is at a record low. And of course we want fair uh, and uh, meaningful and purposeful employment as well. And to support families, that of course includes uh, a social security system based on dignity and respect. We are working on our more targeted income support or income uh, supplement measures because that targeted measure I think will make a greater difference uh, to, to some of the other alternatives that have been pr proposed. Now I hear Labour members shout, bring it forward. You see my job is to deliver a balanced, competent budget. And that's exactly what I am doing. Now, we will have to make, we will have to make uh, the uh, necessary revenues uh, available uh, to fulfil our commitments. And that's what we are doing. And it's commitments such as investing in the National Health Service, such as tackling the attainment gap, such as mitigating against pernicious UK welfare policies. But you see, Labour members, once again, really do need to reflect on the fact that for as long as they leave the economic 
uh, levers and the social levers at Westminster. There is only so much we can do to safeguard Scotland and to mitigate the impact of Westminster decisions. And that's why we should have the power and the resources in this place to fully protect the people of Scotland. Rona Mackay to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Thank you. Uh, tackling climate change is one of the most pressing challenges facing the world today. In what ways does this budget help Scotland meet its climate change obligations? Cabinet Secretary. I have uh, just some examples. We're doing more around energy uh, efficiency. Uh, we're on track to make half a billion pounds available over the four years to 2021 to improve energy efficiency through the Energy Efficient Scotland route map. Uh, we're investing nearly £59 million in forestry priorities, including support to stimulate and enable woodland creation across Scotland. We're investing £80 million in active travel uh, to help build an active nation to make our towns and cities friendlier and safer places. We're investing £50 million in the low carbon transport measures, including the expansion of electric vehicles, charging infrastructure. Uh, and we're also continuing to deliver the Climate uh, Justice Fund. So we continue to invest £42 million annually in local authority flood prevention projects as well mentioned earlier. So there's a, there's a flavour of some of the actions to help protect our environment as well, of course, taking forward the, the most, climate, uh, the most uh, ambitious climate change targets in the world. Andy Whiteman to be followed by George Adam. Thanks, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary and his predecessor talk much about progressive taxes. HMRC data show that the bottom 20% of earners pay in direct and indirect taxes 38% of their income. The top 20% pay 37.4. He knows that a progressive tax is when the rate rises with the tax base. Given the data I've noted, and given that a large reason for that is the regressivity of the council tax, when will he provide leadership to deliver the commitment made by his party, by my party, by the Labour Party, and by the Liberal Democrats in the Local Tax Commission that, I quote, the present council tax system must end. Cabinet Secretary. But the Scottish Government was elected on a 2016 manifesto in relation to the council tax that I've delivered in terms of it being more progressive, increasing the higher uh, value bands and also the council tax cap. So what I have been delivering is what was in the SNP manifesto. But I recognise, I recognise that in this chamber, uh, this government is a minority government and we need to look uh, in a consensual cross-party way to find the uh, alternatives to that and I am going to be constructive and open and engaging in having that discussion. I'm sure that Andy Whiteman will be as well. George Adam to be followed by Peter Chapman. Thank you, presiding officer. I know that the cabinet secretary is a keen sports fan and that the Scottish government is committed to improving health and well-being. With this in mind, can I ask the cabinet secretary what funding has been made available to Sports Scotland to boost activity and participation in sport? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I thank George Adam for that compliment, I think. Um, I didn't realise that supporting St Martin Football Club qualified me, but, but of course it does. I hear uh, George Adam shout from a sedentary position. Um, in 2019-20, Sports Scotland will receive a 3% funding uplift to support the priority of getting Scotland active. The Scottish Government will continue to underwrite the potential shortfall in lottery funding of up to £3.4 million for Sports Scotland in 2019-20 and will continue to encourage the UK Government to take the necessary actions to address lottery reductions. Peter Chapman to be followed by Colin Smith. Presiding officer, we have been promised for some time under the R100 programme a spend of £600 million to deliver superfast broadband to everyone in Scotland. Yet I see from the budget just published. It's your promise. It's your promise. Yet I see from the budget oh, yeah, just published in page 146 the total digital it's connectivity spending oh. in 2019-20 is only 32.9 million. What has happened to the 600 million, and when will superfast broadband be delivered to remote and rural areas? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Well. I can tell Peter Chapman that we are still committed to spend that £600 million to take superfast broadband to every part of the country, which is an incredible investment considering it was the UK government's yeah. responsibility yeah. in yeah. terms... Yeah. ..in terms of telecommunications. But we're investing 
and our infrastructure. The total infrastructure spend proposed in this budget is £5 billion, a fantastic investment in the infrastructure of our country and no doubt opposed by the Conservatives. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Colin Smith to be followed by Julian Martin. President officer, this week ScotRail introduced a new timetable, but it's business as usual for Scotland's hard-pressed rail passengers. Delays, overcrowding and cancellations. Performance is the worst since this rail franchise began, but come January, fares will increase by 10% in that time. Why didn't the Cabinet Secretary use this budget process to try to give Scotland's long-suffering rail passengers a break instead of simply rubber-stamping yet another fare hike? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it would be helpful if we had control, and I know this as a former transport minister, control of network rail in Scotland rather than leaving it to the UK. That's actually a significant issue. And the Labour Party could greatly help the rail network in Scotland if they supported us in transferring that power uh, to Scotland. Of course, it's this government that's investing in more trains and new trains and and in fact, frankly, an electrified service that will be better investing in Queen Street and the Edinburgh to Glasgow improvement project as well. So where the Labour Party spoke about the railway network, we're actually delivering and getting on with it. In relation to rail fares, and I hear James Kelly shout about what the, the rail freeze that Labour's proposing. No, Labour's proposing a shambles of an alternative budget, not any competent budget whatsoever. Rail fares in Scotland will go up by an average of 2.8% in January 2019. This means that the average rate of increase for Scottish rail fares remains lower than the average increase across Britain, which is 3.1%. Julian Martin to be followed by Liam Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what his announcement today with regard to the increase in health budget means for NHS Grampian? Cabinet Secretary. I have the uh, specific figure to hand, but I'm quite sure that Gillian Martin will be able to welcome that in terms of the overall increase that the health service will enjoy. Liam Kerr to be followed by Neil Findlay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The SNP promised to drive forward police transformation, including vital IT upgrades in their programme for government. This budget appears to cut police reform funding by around 25 million. Has he broken his promise to police officers? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, I haven't. The commitment was to protect uh, the, the resource budget in real terms, and that's exactly what we've done. Neil Findlay to be followed by Gil Patterson. People are supposed to be uh, Scotland's greatest asset, yet a thousand of them a year are dying on our streets from drugs. There's no extra money in this budget to address this national crisis that is not just in this city, but in every town across Scotland. It is not even mentioned in the whole of the budget. Why? Cabinet Secretary. The, the Scottish Government invests in strategies through health and through local government, and both of those particular portfolios will enjoy an increase in real terms. And as I said earlier, as I set out very clearly, if I had left it to the numbers that I had inherited from the Conservative Party, it would have been real terms reduction for all other portfolios other than health. But I've invested in both health and local government, and of course there'll be strategies and support within that to support those that uh, Neil Finlay has mentioned. Gil Patterson to be followed by Edward Mountain. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. Although there is a significant uh, building of affordable houses in my constituencies, unfortunately we need more. Will the Cabinet Secretary outline what the budget can do to continue this welcome and vital work? And can I say, if I get a good answer, I'll definitely vote for the budget. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, I, I really hope I can get Gil Patterson's support for the budget. Otherwise, I really am uh, in trouble. Um, presiding officer, the commitment I've set out in the budget for housing specifically is over £800 uh, million pounds, uh, for the next financial year, and that's contributing to the £3 billion pounds commitment around housing to reach the 50,000 target. We're on track, and it's good news. Of course, it's a necessary and welcome uh, investment in housing, uh, and I'm sure that will cover every part of the country, including Gil Patterson's constituency. And hopefully that and everything else in this budget will encourage Gil Patterson and all other members to vote for it. Edward Mountain to be followed by Sandra Boyd. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, for a point of clarity, the Scottish Government has set aside £121 million for the next two years for two new ferries. I believe the cost of the two new hybrid ferries was £97 million. 
Is the Scottish Government committing to a further new ferry or anticipating the contract for the two hybrid ferries will exceed the £97 million budget cost by £24 million? Cabinet Secretary. We are investing in the ferry network. Um, we have uh, clearly set out a position in terms of the, the procurement issue uh, at Ferguson's at the moment, but we're continuing to invest in our ferry network, uh, be that the direct investment around, for example, road equivalent tariff. And in terms of vessels, we do set out a vessel replacement and investment strategy, and I'm sure the, the Transport Secretary will be uh, very uh, keen to set out more in due course. Sandra White, to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Having hosted a very successful cross-party group of older people uh, this afternoon, loneliness and isolation actually came top of the agenda in regards to uh, older people and what they're expecting. Uh, can the, the Cabinet Secretary tell me, regarding the framework policy and older people and the strategy, is there a timescale for that? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I think that would be uh, a matter for other colleagues, uh, principally the Community Secretary, um, but I know that the investments we're putting in place around um, social uh, inclusion are, are significant. Uh, the uplift to local government will be welcomed. And of course we're taking a preventative approach as well. And uh, further areas to welcome will be around health and social care, integration to support people in their own homes as well. So those are the kinds of investment that I think will help in terms of social uh, isolation. And we're certainly doing everything we can within our powers to support older people within our society. Jackie Bailey to be followed by John Scott. Could I refer the Cabinet Secretary to the section of his budget document on Scottish water? Because there's no mention of the single person's discount, try as I might to find it. Can he therefore confirm that he has abandoned proposals to cut the single person's water discount? Or is he still intent on robbing half a million people in Scotland, the majority of whom are on low and fixed incomes? Cabinet Secretary. Right, I can advise Jackie Bailey that Rosanna Cunningham's taken forward that consultation. She'll look at the um, submissions to it. No decisions will be taken, but I'm sure the, the Chamber will be updated in due course. John Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, while I welcome the increase in the budget for education, particularly nurseries of £175 million, will the Cabinet Secretary ensure that support intended for capital investment in infrastructure will be reasonably and fairly distributed between the public and private sector providers, particularly in South Ayrshire? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the Deputy First Minister and Education Secretary will take forward this very exciting programme. Uh, the commitment and the arrangements that we have with local government is a partnership approach. It is a multi-year settlement. It's been agreed uh, with them uh, in a formula, in a fashion uh, that, that, that represents a partnership uh, approach. Uh, the actual resources we're putting in are substantial to meet that commitment around uh, early learning and childcare. And of course, we'll want to work uh, with the private sector and partnership nurseries as well. So we're taking this forward in a very constructive fashion, but we are putting our money where our mouths are in terms of investing in early years, investing in childcare and ensuring that, that entitlement will be so welcomed across uh, the country is being delivered in accordance with the plan that the Deputy First Minister has set out. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary members, for their contributions. That concludes our budget statement this afternoon. We're going to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 15118 in the name of Graeme Day on behalf of the Bureau. Could I call on Graeme Day to move the motion? Thank you very much. And no one seems to wish to speak against the motion. I call. The question is, sorry, that motion 15118 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of motion 15119 in the name of Graeme Day on behalf of the Bureau on the stage one timetable of a bill. Could I ask Graeme Day to move this motion? Thank you very much. And again, no one seems to wish to speak against it. The question is that motion 15119 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The next item is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 15120 on the designation of a lead committee. Could I ask Graeme Day to move the motion? Moved, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. That one will be taken at decision time, to which we now come. So the only question today is that Motion 15120 in the name of Graeme Day on the designation of a lead committee be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move on to members' business shortly in the name of Gordon Lindhurst on remembering the Korean War. We'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to change seats.